Hello, this is Annie Sprinkle for Saturday, March 12th, and this is your daily scoop today. And um, I'm going to be making ice cream with a little gal today. Uh, she is actually the granddaughter of a dear friend and colleague of mine. So we're going to make chocolate, plain old chocolate. And it also happens to be my stepson Zach's favorite flavor. So uh, we're going to do that. And actually, Zach's been tuning in to the Daily Scoop periodically, and he's liking it. I'm getting lights, lots of nice compliments. So for folks that are tuning in for the very first time, I'll just let you know that uh, the Daily Scoop is about domestic violence awareness. And it's about making and selling and eating homemade ice cream. You know, kind of as a way to make this a more palatable conversation and uh, to promote healthy and loving and delicious intimate partner relationships and families um, and just spread peace and harmony so we can fight this infection or this affliction that we call domestic and sexual violence in our society. And it's happening in very obvious and and in subtle ways around us every day. So the Daily Scoop is about talk, you know, just sharing some real life stories and experiences. And today I'm actually going to um, share one of my own personal experiences because it happened recently and I'm feeling a little, just a little, not anxiety, but um, I'm actually going to be going to the establishment where tonight, where something, you know, a domestic, I'm just going to say it, a domestic violence situation happened there the last time I was at this, um, it's a bar, a restaurant, and I witnessed like 30 to 40 people remaining silent, and this particular person not being held accountable, and Another thing that happened that night, and again, I'll, I'll dive into the story and, and go back, but I was actually personally um, not assaulted or physically assaulted, but I'll share my story. But this particular person also, um, you know, said something and did, did something to me uh, that was very intimidating. So I'm going to share a personal story about that, but I want to you know, step back to the beginning of the night and kind of talk about how people around what was going on were were responding and reacting, or I should say lack, lack thereof. Um, so today I, I'll do that, but I also want to bring uh, somebody uh, into the room that's a colleague of mine, and I don't mean physically. Um, I'll do it through sharing what I have learned and also what I have taught through a program called Mentors in Violence Prevention, MVP. And one of the founders is Jackson Katz. And you see a lot of posts and shares on my Facebook page from Jackson. And that's uh, because we've done a lot of work together uh, in the past, golly, 10 years. So one of the things I'm going to read after I share this story is uh, 10... It's, a, it's something from the curriculum, and it, it's a poster that was produced by MVP Strategies, uh, a gender violence prevention education and training organization. And it's called, it's titled, I should say, 10 Things Men Can Do to Prevent Gender Violence. And then tomorrow, I'll read the one that is 10 Things Women Can Do to Prevent Gender Violence. Um, so we'll focus on that today. And I'll share a little bit about what happened recently um, that I want people to be thinking about because you probably see this yourself. So I'm with my sister-in-law at this particular establishment and uh, everybody's kind of minding their own business. It's a big, huge uh, square bar. And... Um, you know, we're minding our own business, everybody's in their own conversations, and all of a sudden, we hear a woman um, kind of screaming, yelling, and then 
you know, saying um, some profanities and storming out. So she had to walk behind me and my sister-in-law stormed out the door um, crying. And um, so, of course, we turned around quickly to see, you know, who she was with and what the situation was. And then the couple that was standing next to us um, just kind of rolled their eyeball, you know, eyeballs, and they're like, yeah, whatever. And I'm like, do you know that person, that woman that just left? Well, not really, just from coming in here. And I said, do you think she's okay? I mean, is she safe? And they're like, I don't know, kind of shrugging their shoulders. And they're like, well, didn't you just see what happened? And I, my sister-in-law and I were like, well, no, our backs were like not facing that way. And the guy goes, yeah, he like took the open part of his hand and put it over her face and just squeezed it and then pushed her. He goes, oh yeah, they're always in, you know, they're always in arguments and always fighting, and there's always this kind of a scene here uh, with those two. And my sister-in-law and I were like, what? Like, isn't anybody going to do anything? Isn't anybody going to stop this? And um, they said, oh, yeah, the cops will come in in a little while, and they'll, like, five of them, and they'll take him out, and he'll go, and he'll leave without incident. And then he'll be back in an hour, and he'll order his beers, and um, his presence will be known that, you know, nobody really can touch him. And I said, that's interesting. And they just proceeded to say all this stuff about this guy. Like, well, you know, um, the the town that we were in, they, the police protect him. They don't really do anything to him. He can't really be touched because, you know, he's involved in some groups that are, you know, um, it's kind of like the good old boys thing. So they mentioned some things, and I'm not going to say it. Um, and I said, well, that's pretty scary. So uh, sure enough, an hour later, he was back. And... Um, about five minutes later, you know, we were talking about that, and I was like, holy moly, they're right. They were right. He's back. So I proceeded to go to the bathroom, and he followed me, which I did not know. And in this particular establishment, you have to go behind the bar and then down, like, a back hallway to get to both the men and the women's room. So I'm heading back. Don't know he's behind me. And just as I'm opening, swinging open the women's door, I hear in a low voice, gruffing, Ugh, get, get in here with me. I need you to hold something for me. And my knees uh, began to shake, and my heart began to pound, and I quickly opened the door to see if there was any other women in the bathroom, and there were. Um, there was another woman in there. So I felt safe enough to go in there, and um, I just asked her if we could just walk out together. So we did, and um, so that isn't okay. And I just want to share that story, and I would like to, um, any men who are listening, just kind of think about that and how you might respond if, um, you know, now that you've heard that story and what you might be thinking. And uh, sure enough, you know, I came home and I, um, I shared what went on because uh, my husband and my stepson were not with me that night. And I withheld for about a week the story about when I went to the bathroom. But I shared the whole, all the other stuff that went on and how nobody did anything. And I couldn't believe that all these people watched it. And the bartender was, you know, really kind of blaming her like, well, yeah, she's a nutcase too. And, you know, all this kind of stuff. So um, it just amazes me how it's not only subtle but obvious and all the victim blaming that went on and all the silence and all the collusion and um, it just makes me think, wow, we really still have a lot of work to do if nobody really did anything. Um, and several people said, oh, this is a common thing. This is happening all the time, you know. So I don't... Um, you know, I shared it with him, and I did withhold that part of the story because I just wanted to see, like, what would you guys have done, you know? And, you know, pretty much the consensus in there was nobody messed with him because he was big, and he was connected to, quote-unquote, a couple different groups that are protected, um, you know, by the police in different agencies and stuff like that. These are all, like, rumors. I'm just repeating what I heard. 
Um, so um, just want people to be thinking about that stuff. So, you know, it was like, well, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know if I would have been scared. I wasn't really there. I'm not sure how I would have reacted. I don't really know what I would have done or said. Um, you know, a lot of people are afraid of guys like this, and they just would rather stay silent. So about a week later when I said, well, you know, then this happened to me. Um, then it was a little bit different reaction, like, you got to go talk to the owner. I mean, we don't want patrons like that, you know, going into places, you know, if I can play there or, you know, you're going to go. So it did change a little, but it was still kind of, you got to go <laughs> talk to the owner. So anyways, I want to get people thinking about these things. I want you to be opening your eyes and looking around you and... Um, like I said, that particular night, I remained quiet. Now, if the woman would have come back, I would have felt safe to intervene, and I would have given her um, a card um, or a phone number that she could call, a palm card, you know, with services on it, very small, can fit, you know, right in your wallet. Um, or just at least say, I'm concerned for your safety, and I'd, I'd like you to have this phone number in case you ever feel like you need some help. But that didn't happen. Uh, so that would have been my only thought. What I did do, though, is I left several of those cards on the bathroom, on the back of the toilet, and um, over by the sink, uh, some of the palm cards for the local domestic violence center uh, with their hotline number on it, which I don't think you can see it on your screen, but it's 222-7233. Um, so I do leave those behind, and those are subtle ways that I help and that hopefully I can make a difference in, um, you know, in someone's life that might see that and go, you know, maybe I better call that number. So anyways, um, you know, I just wanted to share that and get people thinking and opening their eyes and looking around them and, you know, think about that scenario and what might have you have done. Uh, would you have stayed silent? Would you have said something. And on another daily scoop, we'll talk about some other ways bystanders, or I call them upstanders, can intervene safely in these situations. Even if it's not right then and there, there's things you can do indirectly, maybe a later time. And I'll give you some of those tips as we go along in these daily scoops. But what I'm going to read right now is right from um, the MVP strategies, and this is 10 things men can do to prevent gender violence. So number one, approach gender violence as a men's issue involving men of all ages and socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic backgrounds. View men not only as perpetrators or possible offenders, but as empowered bystanders or upstanders who can confront abusive peers. Two, if a brother, friend, classmate, or teammate is abusing his female partner or is disrespectful or abusive to girls and women in general, don't look the other way. If you feel comfortable doing so, try to talk to him about it. Urge him to seek help. Or if you don't know what to do, consult a friend, a parent, a professor, counselor or an advocate or call this number. Don't remain silent. Number three, have the courage to look inward. Question your own attitudes. Don't be defensive when something you do or say ends up hurting someone else. Try hard to understand how your own attitudes and actions might inadvertently perpetuate sexism and violence and work towards changing them. Four, if you respect, if you suspect that a woman close to you is being abused or has been sexually assaulted, gently ask her if you can help. Number five, if you are emotionally, psychologically, physically, or sexually abusive to women or have been in the past, Seek professional help now. Number six, be an ally to women who are working to end all forms of gender violence. Support the work of campus-based women's centers.